My name is Simon McCune. I'm a, a reader at the, in the School of Computing at the University of, at Teesside University now, which is based in Middlesbrough in the north of England. Uh, by training, I'm actually uh, a fine artist rather than a, a computer technician or engineer. Um, and over the last 20 years, I've worked in industry, um, both in the computer games industry and in uh, the television industry, producing lots of work for many different clients. Um, Aside from that, aside from the normal commercial work, I have a, a very strong interest in all manner of issues to do with disability. And in particular, the way and means by which we display disability in our culture, in our media. Um, although I'm concentrating on UK, UK examples in this presentation, many of the issues and many of the things I'll be talking about will be common in other media in, in other countries. There's a, an exhibition slide from the work which I'll be talking about. Um, news, newspapers commonly cover issues uh, about disability with either the discussion of their sort of hero disability, the hero disabled person who's conquered all, or the, the tragic dis disabled person who, who is very much a victim. Um, and if we believe the press, we as a, as a society obviously have serious issues with regard to disability and almost the extreme of it is expressed by our newspapers. You can see here a slide by um, the BBC which covers a story to do with the, um, the death of a disabled family in Leicester where they were failed to be protected by the, the police for instance. Uh, another story about the vicious degrading attack on a, a disabled woman while she was dying. The alleged discussion by ambulance uh, staff as to the worth of protecting and saving and recovering somebody's life while they lay dying. These stories are very, very common in the press and they do represent the extreme, the tragedy and the, the heroic. What these, what these stories don't do and what they, they almost never do is portray the everyday life. Oops, come back to that. What they don't, everyday life for disabled is very, is a different issue with up to 10% of the UK claiming that they have some kind of disability that's one in 10 people it can actually be in, in some studies seen as one in eight one in eight people but we, we don't really see this, uh, this this number reflected in the cultural media that we watch so my interest in disability comes from comes from that but also my background uh, for instance I had two, two uncles who had prosthetic legs um, I grew up with limbs lying around. My uncle asking me, have you seen my leg? So I wouldn't be surprised if somebody hopped out of this room and, and left one behind. I wouldn't be shocked or frightened. But according to the press, we are shocked and frightened by the absence of a limb. Is TV really that scary for children? TV dramas documentaries should offer a much more insightful study of disability and this slide is from Britain's Missing Top Model which on the surface could be a really interesting program about presentation of disability in terms of how people feel empowered and so on. Instead when I watched this program there was some deeply disturbing scenes in it. Um, what we see quite often is the contestant almost being pilloried for for not being able to function correctly, for not being able to pose correctly, uh, for the camera, for the crew. Now this might just be down to the editing, but towards the end of it you get the feel that really the contestants are being laughed at. Certainly as a viewer I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to be expected to, to feel and understand. These programmes are very strange and there's lots of them. Beyond Boundaries by the BBC was a deeply unusual programme. It was a jungle brace, a jungle based freak show. Eleven disabled people crossing a South American jungle as a unit as a where we looked at them as if they were in a fishbowl. The world's smallest man and me. Again another strange show going around the world to study and you know, really showcase and almost, I think, sort of giggle at a person with 
in their terms an oddity. We have a situation in that programme where the smallest man becomes a toy, almost a to almost toy-like. And yet, probably the most enlightened disability uh, that is on television at any one time is probably Family Guy. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it. Um, and it's certainly the most intelligent disabled jokes and comedy. And one of my favourite um, one of my favourite gags from that joke is Handy Quacks, which is the story of three disabled ducks. And the, the, the lead character, Peter Griffin, writes his own cartoon. And we see him present to a TV executive a completely facile, empty story to the TV executive who ultimately loves it and commissions the series. And it's just mind-numbing in its emptiness, really. And it is a reflection on it, a parody of all of the previous programmes that I've mentioned. On a more positive note, Channel 4 recently showcased cast-offs. Cast-offs featured some great actors, um, again, stuck in this mode of isolating a group of actors, a group of disabled people as a unit so we can study them. But in this situation, the flashback scenes to the actors' earlier lives were, very, were, were actually quite effective. We got to see the actors at home being themselves. But what was distinctly odd about it, other than the fact that it was a, yet again a group of disabled actors together, what was distinctly odd about it was that it started with this clip. Why do scenes of disabled people contain elements that viewers may find offensive? This occurred at 11 o'clock at night on Channel 4 for the six episodes that cast-offs cast -offs presented. Why do we feel it necessary to, to warn that there will be an element of disability coming up? Do we do that for any other culture, any other race, any other type of person, basically? There is some light at the end of the tunnel. Channel 5 recently spent an entire day with James Partridge presenting. And quite, quite encouragingly, 64% of people said they would not switch over if the news was constantly presented by somebody with a facial dis disfigurement. We shouldn't be surprised by that. With one in eight people, uh, one in eight of the population having some kind of disability, and many people in this room will go on to acquire a disability. I do question that we, that we need warnings. Why is our media quite poor at representing disability? Why do we need to see it as a freak show, something other, something that we are disconnected from? Motion Disabled came from that kind of understanding, my background my knowledge of disability and what I'd like to do is, is talk about it. Um, the outline of the project involved capturing disabled people as they undertake elements of their ordinary day-to-day -day life. So it was specifically set out to avoid the freakishness and the, the, the kind of funny study that the, the normal channels would do. All the actors decided their own moves and contributed fully. So Craig Salisbury Craig's first, uh, Craig works in the entertainment industry and his first film was Steven, Spie Steven Spielberg's Willow. He was one of the characters in that. Frank Letch, uh, a retired language teacher, uh, effectively with no arms. You can see him brushing his teeth there. Uh, recently uh, reviewed on ITV Wales. Matt Fraser, kickboxer performer, comedian, theatre star, uh, actor. Um, Dr Paul Dark, one of uh, Britain's uh, m most important writers about disability and disability art. Luke, Ar Luke Hardwick and Pauline Heath, both actors. Uh, Pauline is also a dancer. Tanya Raby, exhibited at uh, the National Portrait Gallery and Richard Hardesty on the left. Now these last two slides I've shown for deliberately because they involve technology at a later, slightly later stage and we can now see some still images of the work. So on the left we have Craig Salisbury working in his kitchen 
shut in his car boot. This is how he would go go around his house. Um, Frank Letch answering his phone. Tremendous animation. Drops his bag on the floor which he carries. He's using his feet. He throws the phone in the air. He captures it in his neck and he answers the phone. Luke Hardwick, who has a fantastic walk as an animator, probably one of the most interesting walks I've actually studied, uh, working in his kitchen, carrying a box. Matt Fraser, kickboxing. At nearly 50 year old, Matt is one of the fittest people I've worked with. He's a thalidomide affected person. And there we see on the right, we see Matt having a shower. Now, this is the, uh, the video of, this is a short video of the work.
So that was a short review of it, and there's actually quite a lot of it, and it's meant to be shown on many screens at once, so that there's always a lot of different divergent things going on. So all the moves are meant to be uh, about a person's daily life. The work was deliberately uh, produced in that fashion. Uh, an early test there shows it when we developed quite characterful characters, but I stepped back from that to produce something which was really uh, much more, uh, less about the, the people's face and so on. The, the moves that by people have got cerebral palsy, spina bifida, um, lots of different physically challenging issues, and, and that raises technical issues. This is a screenshot of the motion capture tool that we use to, to, to capture and record the, the effectively the X, Y, Z points in space for each, for each marker that we place on the shoulder and elbow and so on. This, this system and, and all the animation systems that we use um, expect um, a, a common uniform body shape. It expect, they expect effectively a biped. What's interesting is when you work with um, people with unusual body forms is that it quite quickly breaks that software. So this is a piece of software called Motion Builder. It's used extensively in the, in the uh, animation and film industry. It was used on Avatar, for instance. Here we're applying the, the capture and motion um, of Tanya Raby, the, the person who we saw painting. Tanya has inverted wrists um, so the hands are effectively on backwards and slightly al alternative uh, elbows and feet uh, a foot as you can just see there is um, constantly at 90 degrees to its to a, to a, a normal position if you like and so here we are setting up the skeleton for Tanya to transfer the data on it this just takes a minute to play through just in the scale to match Tanya. We're just starting to work on her, her arm and to adjust the, uh, the position of the arm. See there we've rotated it to, which would be correct to Tanya. A minute. So that would be a representation of Tanya's physicality. Press save, do a bit more. Because it's in PowerPoint, I haven't got a way of fast forward in this particular video clip from the production. What we're doing now is assigning the actor to the motion, which is the images that you can see on the bottom right hand side, setting a template up to transfer the data, and this is how it would be converted and exported uh, for game use and film use. can see there that as we go to the final save we crash the system because it was expecting something quite normal and that's what we found as we worked through the project with all the the non-standard uh, body forms basically um, I'll go back to one of my favorite clips this is of uh, Richard Hardesty who is uh, a, a mad mountain bike rider with prosthetic leg 
and uh, the systems wouldn't even the animation systems that we that we're using computer games today would not be able to simulate um, him falling off a bike, walking his run. The the computer game systems are are still even the best, which use excellent artificial intelligence, are still based on using uh, that fairly standard, fairly fairly average sort of body form. So, in a sense, if we wanted to see the uh, to, to see that kind of move in a computer game, it's got to be bespoke. It's got to be individual. That can't be afforded for cost reasons, physical cost reasons, the amount of staff involved, and also the overheads on the actual system. I'm quite shocked by what I see as the presentation of disability. Motion disabled is my attempt to um, present things slightly differently in a different way. The first attempt at doing this was at Wolverhampton Art Gallery. Uh, last February, the, the children there, and we asked them, and the gallery asked them, actually loved the uh, the the, the amputee-like avatars, which is in complete uh, complete difference to the uh, report by the BBC. But I've also managed to do to to do it on a big scale. Um, this is these are images from Leeds, where um, I was able to take over this tower block and project on a very large scale, including on in the city square. Uh, there's a shot there. Up to 50,000 people saw the work that night. It was uh, a, a different edit than you've seen, but it was um, um, projected tall, so it was the opposite of widescreen. Um, and as a result of that work, I'm hoping to uh, be able to show, show the work outside in different venues. Um, for the future, I hope to see more complex, more divergent characters in computer games. I'm looking forward to the technology improving, the technology that I work with improving, and I hope to see an increased intelligent representation of disability on television. Um, we are missing a trick if we go down this route of normality. We are losing, we, we're at a point in, in society where we are potentially able to pick and mix genes, pick and mix our future to a large extent. Some of the people in this work will not exist in the future, um, uh, some of the certainly two of the disabilities will uh, will, will not exist uh, in the near future. Thalidomide and um, spina bifida, for instance, possibly won't exist. I think we're missing the trick if we stay with the we stay with the normal and we ignore the diversity and the interest. This project was just to conclude was sponsored by the Wellcome Trust, who came to it with a, uh, a scientific point of view. Uh, they were interested in the whole issue of body forms and and where our future will be, uh, sponsored by a number of different people. Um, it cost a lot, a quarter of a million images, 12 disabled actors. Um, it used motion capture to produce uh, uh, a little sculpture, for instance, one of the first times I've seen that used in terms of uh, a 3D motion capture output in 3D objects, uh, came with a documentary and a website. That's it, thank you very much.